Good morning. My name is Morgan Denton. I'm the English Language Arts Specialist in the Maine Department of Education. I'm thrilled today um, to be hosting Neil Rue, who is going to talk to you about um, technology integration in our ELA classrooms. And Neil is being assisted by Tiff Shaw, I should say, supported. Tiff Shaw is our technical support for sure. Um, so I am simply going to turn the rest of this session over to the two of them. Thank you very much. Awesome, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm gonna basically be hopping back and forth a little bit just to let you know between screen sharing and, and we'll come back here for some breakout rooms, which I'll cover in a second. So um, with that said, I'm gonna leap right into screen sharing here. All right, um, and I may present, normally I would, I would have this fill the, the whole screen, but some of what I'm doing is kind of hopping back and forth and it makes it easier to, to sort of minimize. So um, just right off the bat, know that all of you are getting access to this, this and all the documents that you'll see today, especially at the end, Morgan's been very kind and put all those into one document for you. So anything you see today that you want access to, you'll have it, okay? Um, so the, the basic philosophy is today, when <sighs> distance learning March 12th rolled around and I think all of us started getting links for like, here are a hundred links to explore for all the different technology that we have. Um, and, if, and if you're like me, it, it was an immediate like panic attack. Um, even, even to somebody who's got some tech comfort, uh, it, it was almost like an outpouring of so much support. So what I tried to do with this um, PD is to kind of curate a list of, uh, of from, from tips to tails, basically where I think people or what I think people need to think about, um, but in a more condensed version. So whatever your tech level today, if you're already an expert, the first couple tiers might be sort of old hat to you but hopefully in the third tier, we'll get to some, uh, some new stuff that'll make you think. Um, if you're the tech phobic, as I said in the title of this presentation, uh, there's a lot to learn, but the goal today is exposure, not mastery. So I'm gonna move fast in the interest of trying to wrap up around 10. Um, if I miss something, Tiff is there handling questions in the chat. Um, she's been a fantastic resource and uh, it, you know, I'll do my best to sort of serve everybody's needs. But the first thing I want to talk about is, is establishing healthy parameters for uh, distance learning because um, like Morgan was just saying before this, um, we can be on a Zoom meeting, we can be on a, a Meets meeting, we can be on FaceTime, like we, we, can, we can actually now be in two places at once and uh, we need to make sure that we sort of regulate and think about those cell, ourselves. So the, the first quote that I, I pulled just made me, it sort of expressed how I felt. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge is how, how we're all feeling, which is uh, Michael Caine, one of my favorite actors, it says, always be like a duck, calm on the surface, but paddling like the Dickens underneath. I think March 12th, we were trying to be the face of calm for many of our students and peers, but man, our feet were moving under the water, so, uh, and still are. So uh, that, that sense of swimming furiously might, might hit today, and that's okay. So it, acknowledge that we're all feeling like that, and we're sort of surviving right now, but hopefully after today, you know, this is June, this gives us more time to plan versus being reactive, we can now be proactive. And so, what does that mean for us? Think about what's most important, which is our health, always. Uh, take some breaks, move around. Um, I think there sometimes feels like an obligation to be on screen all the time or connecting with everyone all the time and, and so many families have so many needs and so many of us have so many needs. Um, regulate that a little bit. Some people have found it healthy to make schedules for themselves, there are some distance learning templates out there for that. Um, carve some you time in there to, to be sure for that. If you're on screen for a couple hours, you know, try to interact, you know, go outside, do something to counterbalance that for a little bit. In terms of how today's gonna work as we go through here, um, as I just mentioned, the slideshows will be available to you um, during the presentation so that I don't start sounding like a drunken robot. Um, if you turn off your video and mute um, except during the breakout sessions, that typically helps with the streaming load. Um, as I said, Tiff is my superhero. She's handling questions in the chat. Um, Morgan's gonna post the breakout session, so we've got a couple of superheroes helping out. As Morgan mentioned, everything's getting recorded, so if I'm speaking too fast or you miss something, you can go back and watch this again after it's posted. And my one personal request, normally these are for everybody, but my personal one is please don't take a screenshot if I have an awkward frozen face, if the screen suddenly seizes up, uh, as I told my, my faculty, I don't want that showing up in my school yearbook, right? It's not how I want to be known. Um, so what exactly did you sign up for? I'm going to do my best to keep this to some mini tutorials. 
We're going to have some breakout work sessions for about five minutes each. It's not long, but it's, it's to get a conversation started. Um, we'll do that a couple times, and then we'll hopefully have some time to share out at the end. And if that was too general for you, uh, we're going to cover some key terms. I'm going to quickly go over like just some thoughts about digital etiquette. There's an acronym called SAMR, which I'll talk more about. The second tier is going to be some about the more frequently used platforms. And the last one's going to be about some more feature rich platforms that I think work for a variety of learning. So before we get into this, um, if you're like me, believe it or not, that is an actual screenshot of what my tabs looked like yesterday and days before. Uh, when I talk about healthy balance, that is poor role modeling right there. Um, so if you need to maybe close a few tabs that will also help with your streaming ability. And then uh, if you have this slideshow open, eventually you can click on that link. Um, Morgan had a good idea to, we created a glossary of terms. Uh, it is a work in progress. So you'll notice some, some blank terms as we're doing these PDs, we're finding out like, what is it that people don't know? So platform, for example, I'll share is a word that mystifies people. That just means any piece of technology that you land on. And, and I guess that's maybe why platform works. So, um, you know, Google Classroom is a platform. Uh, Power Teacher might be a platform or, or whatever it is. So there's some learning management systems as well. Some of these are double terms. Um, eventually, you'll be able to click on that link um, or Morgan might put that link in the chat. Um, and just if you're unfamiliar with some of the terms that I'm sharing today, then um, this is a place to go. And along those lines, out of all those terms, I think the two that we need to know definitely right now are what's called synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, so synchronous learning, we all have to be there at a scheduled time. This is an example of, of, a, of a synchronous opportunity. We're only learning if we're here in the room listening to each other versus an asynchronous opportunity, which is when the learning is just available to you whenever you can get to it. So the recording of this video would be more asynchronous because people can go to the state website after click on it and um, access it when they have time. So thinking about this in our learners context, um, the key takeaway from this is that most learning at this point should be offered asynchronously. Think about your students. Um, I have high school, so I teach 11, 12 ELA at Levitt High School in Turner. Um, I have a lot of older students who are now responsible for their siblings while parents are trying to work in whatever version it is. Well, during the day, that's their thing. They can't focus on their learning and you know, two screaming siblings. Uh, I like to use the term Jimmy. Sorry if anyone's a Jimmy, but when Jimmy's running around and breaking things in the house, right? I can't focus on my, my language essay. So um, offering asynchronous learning is really the best thing right now so that it accommodates all these um, crazy things that people have happening in their lives. Uh, this is, just to give her credit, this is something I came across and uh, you'll hear me mention Jennifer Gonzalez a couple times. I think she's a fabulous resource from the cult of pedagogy. She has a fantastic blog. Um, she's one of the ones I know that's like really working at making um, technology digestible. But um, in terms of distance etiquette, this might be something that we sort of assume but don't cover. But I would encourage you right away to start thinking about um, you know, is your lighting good? Is your sound good? Is your angle good? And then some tips what you should do and what you should not do. So if you want to use this as a template, you know, if we're still distance learning in the fall, whether fully or as a hybrid, um, this might be one of those, just like we do in our classroom, set up some rules for how we're going to go about this. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a healthy conversation to have. Um, so this one, I'm going to slow down just for a second because, um, this is going to be the subject of our first breakout. So if you need to take some notes, you can do so. Um, SAMR is a acronym that is a great way to think about technology moving forward. I think there are some other ones like TPAC and, and some other ones out there, but this is a way of thinking about what you want technology to do for you and your learners. Okay. So, and, and I like the, um, this is from a lady called Sylvia Duckworth uh, in the slideshow. You can actually click on the link and it will take you to her, Twitter feed. She's another one who's got some great thoughts on technology. Um, so we're standing on land there March 12th. That might be some of us with, with really no tech. Um, some things that we're looking for right now are that S, that substitution level, where tech is just a one-to-one -one substitution. I do it this way face-to-face -face in my classroom, but now I can do that um, this way here. Okay. Um, I normally ask a question in my classroom. I'm going to post a question on Google Classroom if that's my platform. So that would be a direct substitution. 
augmentation is when tech acts as a direct tool um, substitute with functional improvement, as it says. Um, it might make it a little bit better. Tech might make it a little bit better. So um, if we're used to having conversations about um, how to solve a problem in math, for example, well, if I incorporate maybe some whiteboarding uh, platforms, um, normally people have to keep track of all that in their head. Well, now we've got visual evidence. We've got those whiteboards and um, that's available to, for people to study after and all the solutions that people tried for that problem would be available in one spot. So that might make the learning just a little bit better. Um, swimming a little bit deeper, we get into what we call modification, um, where there's significant task redesign. Um, I'm thinking here about something like Canva, maybe example, which I'll talk a little bit about, where you can actually create your own infographics or posters and that sort of thing. Well, I, I used to ask my students to design uh, a, a 2D model of cells, but there are actually some 3D modeling out there now where you can draw something, take a picture of it, and then you can display it in sort of the 3D world and rotate it around. So now I've got this like slightly modified, there's some augmentation there, sure, but um, kids have to learn how to do that differently. And so there's some redesign there. And then redefinition is where um, we couldn't do something before, but now we can. Um, so, uh, you know, that's obviously the highest level. I think if, if you're the um, type A personality, you're like, I'm in the submarine. Like you saw this diagram, you're like, what's the highest thing I can shoot for? Um, again, the healthy balance here, many of us might just need to substitute right? Like yeah. we are swimming right now. I just need to be able to do what I know how to do. I can get to the A, the M, and the R later. And, and that's maybe a goal to set for yourself. So redefinition yeah. isn't always possible, but it's, um, it's something to always be thinking about. So um, I know TIFF works a lot with video production. Um, we were just talking about how some of these platforms have modified and um, now have additional features like time stamping and stuff like that. Well, um, I used to just give a long presentation. Now I can sort of redefine that and I can put in links to the section that people want to access. And that's, that's kind of a light version of redefinition or um, those sorts of things. Neil. Yeah. Sorry to break in. But, no uh, is being asked if you could go into presentation mode so the slides are bigger for people to see? Oh, sure. Yep. Thank you. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, and then, so down at the bottom there, it's easy to miss, but the first two we're talking about enhancement again, whereas the last two we're talking about transformation, okay? So take one last look at this, think about where you're at with technology currently, some ideas you might have about it, and we're gonna do our first sort of breakout session here. Um, so Morgan's gonna split us into groups here in a second for about five minutes, and the question, which she'll also post in the chat here, is with regard to the SAMR model and distance learning, what is it that you're looking for right now in order to be prepared in the fall, right? Again, that substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition, where are you at, okay? Um, I think we're gonna be in about three to four person groups. So uh, with five minutes, try to talk a minute-ish so people can not only comment but respond. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys to sort of divvy up At this point, I'm going to pause the recording uh, and I'll restart it when the groups come back.
folks. What's up? Oh my, why are you alone? Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure if my speaker is working or my audio. <laughs> Well, it got, it's got to be because I'm talking to you and I'm hearing you. I, 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 okay. heard the audio. There, there was I couldn't hear. There. I couldn't hear anything until you came in, Morgan. Yeah. Huh. All right. Well. Um, Thanks for dropping in. <laughs> all right. Hopefully, it's all underway now. <laughs> Here we are at the tech session, having tech problems. Go figure. <laughs> of course. Of course. All right. All right, John. Yeah. You looked like you were talking there. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was uh, not entirely sure about the question. I think we're going to run out of time. Um, but about these sort of expectations about our hopes for, for the fall for distance learning. Um, I don't know. I think it was kind of a where, where do you see yourself and, and what are you aiming for? Are you aiming to just get to substitution or? Are you shooting for the moon, trying to trying to get all the way to uh, redefinition, or or sort of where do you see yourself? I will note it's a little bit ironic that one breakout room had some technical problems and I showed up and all problems magically disappeared. I, I don't know what that means, but that was awesome. <laughs> um, Morgan, will you let me know when we've got everybody back, please? Yes, you see where it says participants, it should show yeah. as uh, 27. 27, okay. All right, I'm, I'm gonna say I think they're all back or, okay. Most everyone, okay. Um, so I, I'm gonna go back to screen sharing here, uh, but, but people can comment in a second. Um, go um, so hopefully that that sparks some like good initial conversations here um, and, and does anybody just briefly uh, um, have questions before I move on and, and sort of getting to the next year here or, or some like aha moment that just happened in the chat and you can just unmute yourself and, and get in there if you want uh, I'm thinking in our particular group uh, most of us teach ninth grade ELA and the real concern about um, being able to have some time in some form other than computer to get to interact one-on-one -on -one with our students and how essential that is. Mm. Yeah, and maybe looking at ways to foster that through your activities. So um, I couldn't really, like we ended the year with Macbeth in one of my classes, um, encouraging students to start getting themselves together versus always being at the helm of it. Um, oh yeah, no, I did. I did that with encouraging my kids to have Zoom meetings with themselves. But, but I think the transition from eighth to ninth grade, at least in our district, they're in a whole different building, a whole different part of the city, mm -hmm. and and they're scared and they're going through puberty and creating that classroom environment, creating that, the personal connection. A lot mm -hmm. of my first month and a half is trying to personally connect with each of the students, which is which wasn't bad this year because I'd already made that connection, but it right. terrifies me in September. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to relate to that to some of the tech that I'll be covering today because that's come up a couple times. Um, any other, let's do just questions for right now. Um, just so, again, we stay on track with time. All right, I'm gonna call that wait time and, and kind of keep going here. Uh, I've tried to do this um, at, towards the end. Um, I mentioned Jennifer Gonzalez already. Again, once the slideshow gets shared, uh, one link that I did find is it says gently curated collection. In fact, it was kind of the inspiration for the presentation here. Um, she's really put some thought into how not to overwhelm teachers, and it, it's kind of a nice collection there. Uh, and I'll, I'll put this at the end of each tier here. So the idea I put it on every slide just because 
people might be accessing these after the fact in, in different ways. Um, I try to kind of put what your next level is. In this situation, my email is on there. If you've got questions after the fact, um, feel free to email me or there's a link um, to the next um, tier, which we'll, we'll get to in just a second here. Uh, because we're going to start talking about the more the more frequently used platforms for distance learning. So um, there we go, we're back into full screen mode. Um, and, and I say most used. This is obviously a subjective thing. I, I think one of the hardest things in thinking about today was Mac users, PC users. Um, it, you know, very experienced, not very experienced, and so. Um, forgive, I made sort of a judgment call here. Some of you are going to be using, you're like, well, this is more used in my area. Not a judgment here, just kind of my thoughts here. Um, so these are the four that I want to talk about that have come up the most that I've seen. Um, Google Meet, Zoom, Google Classroom, and I, one called Kid Blog. That's maybe the more subjective one. Um, and we'll try to link these to some of the terms that we've already talked about. Um, Clearly, we're here. Um, basic video discussion. So um, Sharon's comment about like, how am I going to establish that classroom culture? This might be an option. Google Meet. Um, it's not quite as feature rich and maybe a little less intimidating. Um, I'm what I try to do with the slideshow. So I'm not saying the same thing because I don't want me to be a duplicate of what I'm presenting to you. I try to find some decent tutorials in here about how to use these. So you can go back here and watch this and it'll let you know all the ins and outs of Google Meet. Um, this is what I thought people needed to more needed to know more about. For for based on feedback I've had from other people, um, Google Meet has a little bit more ease of use and it's integrated with the G Suite or Google. Uh, for some some of you, that's what your school uses, and so it's very easy to blend that in. Um, Google Classroom now has a link directly to establishing a Google Meet for your class, so that might be the place where everyone lands and gets together and talks and kind of create some of that culture. I mean, it's just constantly there; it's accessible. Um, the only drawback, and this is starting to change because Google buys what works. Um, it's a little bit feature limited right now compared to Zoom, like these breakout sessions and such. Um, and there's normally you can only see four-ish people on the screen, but there is, I put a link there, Google Meet Grid View, where you can install it as an extension for Chrome and you can actually see everybody on your screen at once. So that used to be a limitation that's starting to change. Uh, and so this all would be pretty useless if I don't say like, well, what am I going to do with this stuff? One-on-one um, -on -one conferencing, I found it worked really well this spring because um, again, it's so user friendly. Um, just a student needed sort of an office hours moment. They're struggling with their essay. Let's get together on Google Meet. You don't have to turn your video on if you don't want to. Um, think about some of your students like where they live. They don't want you to see like a messy room or whatever. Um, so it was helpful just to have like video or not, audio or not. Um, I found it really helpful for small group discussions. Um, so again, larger groups, maybe a little better on Zoom, but for small groups, it was particularly effective. And I put some standing office hours out there. Uh, some of us might have to think about a, a regular day and time in, in each week that we're going to be available for each of our classes. Uh, when you create an event on you know, Google Calendar or maybe other calendars, you can actually insert a link to Google Meet right away. So that's another reason why that sort of interaction might work better with Google Meet for some of you. Um, I called Zoom advanced in comparison just because it's got some feature richness to it. Again, solid tutorial here, on especially it's focused on how to use Zoom for remote and online learning. Um, he goes into some of the more advanced features like breakout rooms and reactions that you can turn on. So there's a good tutorial there. A um, lot more pros and cons to consider here. Um, I, without installing an extension, you can see more people on the screen. You can break people out. Um, you can cast your screen or your camera, which we're doing right now. There's a whiteboarding feature. So if you wanted to project something that you want to write on, I think Google Meet has that feature as well, but um, Zoom has, a, I think, a few more tools with it. Um, you can enable nonverbal responses. So if I wanted to right now, I could um, add a reaction and I could, oh, actually, I don't know if we have that turned on. Um, so it, you can put what are called reactions and it's like hands clapping or um, raising hands and that sort of thing. Um, and, and they've got wait rooms and passwords now. They're working on the security things that you might have heard about issue that's in the cons. Um, so it's, it, it takes a little bit more to explore and to learn, but it's, it's got a little bit more control and a little bit more feature richness to it. I think I might have a little lag here. 
Okay. Um, so again, what should you do with it? Uh, you might host live lessons with this one because uh, you can screen or camera cast and use that whiteboarding feature. So those of you looking to like teach that lesson that you've always taught, you wanna um, annotate a poem, you wanna talk about a cell diagram, you wanna show a solution to a math problem, you know, whatever your content area, um, you might be able to whiteboard with that source. It's a little bit easier for a whole class collaboration um, and you already might schedule professional development sessions like these, ironically. Um, and you can also link these meetings to calendar events to put everything in one place and make it easy to find. Um, some of the more asynchronous stuff here. So how could we get some of those same things to happen but available ongoing? Um, I, I put Google Classroom on here just because, again, uh, talking with people, there's a, a lot of uh, people using it, especially since it's a free platform. Um, you might ask a question. So it, in a synchronous opportunity, I can just put the question out there and people can respond to it. In an asynchronous way, I can put the question out there, people can log on and respond to it and, and we get to see everybody's comments. Um, and so this has that ability for students to access whenever they have the time. Uh, you can post uh, media and texts alongside that question. So like read this, um, respond to this question. It's good for essential questions, maybe as like an exit ticket. Uh, there are lots of functions out there. Um, the one drawback that I'll mention out of these that you can read, um, well, there's a couple I'll touch on. Uh, first, it's, it's something that you need to moderate. So if you enable student comments on Classroom and anybody can comment out there, um, you might wanna filter that. Uh, so there, there is some risk out there. You might need to monitor it a little bit actively or turn on notifications when students post because there's a Jimmy everywhere, as I mentioned. Uh, and then uh, you might need to establish that culture. So with, with Sharon's question, what are my expectations? What's my classroom culture like? Um, the I agree syndrome, uh, so-and-so puts this really eloquent response and Jimmy, of course, responds, I agree. Uh, well, I, I wanna know more from him. What do you agree with? What part? Um, and so that might take some active work to establish that culture at first if you're not getting the responses that you want. Um, it, and so how can you use it? Initiate a conversation. You might use it to gather formative data. What do students already know? KWL, something we use a lot. Um, you can also empower students to post examples. So I, I teach AP language. Um, I had students post what they, I said, what's the best rhetoric you've read in the last week? And they put their links on there. And so it became a reading list for people to kind of like check out throughout the week. So, um, or you can theme that or, or put a common topic that peers can relate to. So some, some good potential there. Um, if you want to go a little bit more back and forth with some more feature rich, um, KidBlog is a fairly inexpensive, so it is a paid platform, um, but it's got some powerful blogging um, capacity to it. It's also very easy to control and it interacts with Google Classroom if you're looking with that for that. Um, so you can moderate it much more easily. And so out of all the blogging platforms out there, and I know that there are tons, uh, this is one that, again, feedback from other teachers, they've said, this one just really works for me. I, I didn't love it at first because I, could, I teach 17 and 18 year olds, they're like, really, you're putting me on kid blog. Uh, but so other than the title, it, functionally it's great. So you might have to do some like selling it in terms of its name, uh, but it's, I, I used it for a summer reading response. Uh, you can post a question, students can see and respond to each other um, and, and it lives asynchronously, right? So like whenever they have time, they can get on there, read through responses, get inspired by ideas, um, react to each other. And, um, as you can see from the screenshot there, there's uh, multimedia opportunities. So if I'm a science teacher, I could, I could post a lab. And when the guy's lab coat catches on fire, the question that you have people respond to is what went wrong if you're doing a lab safety unit. So, uh, like it's, it's not just for texts and ELA teachers. I'm trying not to be that. Uh, there's many, many ways that these platforms can be used. Um, it is a paid service as of right now. I think they have a fee reduced. So obviously two weeks ago when I, you know, some of this information might be updated. So with the pros and the cons, realize these are again, sort of subjective, but um, from my perspective, it's very interactive. It's got a lot of feature rich um, capacity that's great. Uh, students don't have to be on camera, which is something to think about. Um, so this is a, a platform where they can, they can do those uh, if, if they have a low Wi-Fi signal or, or, you know, they have to go to the library or the school's parking lot to access it. Um, this is something, again, that's got sort of low demand and, and they can get there whenever they need. Um, on the con side, not really a con, but just an awareness. Again, these more paid platforms, these more feature-rich platforms, you have to go in humble and willing to experiment. 
uh, create a fake blog first and invite your friends and see what goes wrong, right? Uh, before you publish it to the world, try it out. Um, you know, people you trust that aren't gonna blackmail you afterwards, uh, like experiment, put it out there. Um, and, but thinking too, like Google Classroom, for example, I say experiment, create a fake class, but don't put your students in there as sort of an experiment because it's gonna email them inviting them to that, to that classroom. So I already had a teacher I worked with, she's like, help, they think that I'm having summer learning. Um, they think they, they're in like credit recovery or something. So I had to help her sort of recover from that um, and kind of get there. So experiment, but be aware of what you're experimenting with and in what ways. Um, so for me, this is a, a great one for collaborative responses to common sources. Um, you can use this as a platform for students to post digital portfolios. Um, Project-based learning or inquiry-based learning are, are key terms right now. I think it's a fantastic direction for education because it's constructive, it's open, and there's so many rich things that people can do with it. Um, and, and you can post all of them there. And, and certainly Flipgrid and others I'll talk about are places for that too. Uh, but you can assign and schedule intermittent responses too. So um, scheduling is a feature that some of you might want to look at. It's like you don't want to have to be on demand all the time, real timing these like links and meetings. Some of these platforms allow you to schedule things for the future so that um, you, you know you can sort of set yourself up, get a little bit ahead with your planning, and then have some downtime after to sort of process it all. So uh, be thinking about that too. All right. And so uh, I've talked. I haven't talked about screencasting yet, so just be aware with this question for the next breakout. Uh, there's a little bit of envisioning, but some of you are already ahead of video conferencing and you're more into screencasting. So the focus question for this breakout, and I, um, I'm not, I think we might be mixed up in different groups this time um, based on, on content and, and grade levels. What role will video conferencing and or screencasting play in your teaching during what um, Morgan's coined the phrase next normal, right? Um, when we get to whatever the fall is and that becomes our next normal, how do you see video conferencing and or screencasting playing a role? So with Sharon's question, right? How am I gonna leverage this into classroom culture, right? What's, what are some safe spaces, collaborative spaces I can create for kids to like get to know each other, feel safe and feel comfortable sharing their ideas and those sorts of things. So again, five minutes, we'll come back to the main room in a bit. I know these are short breakouts, but again, exposure today, not mastery. Um, and I want to, hopefully we'll have some share time at the end. So um, any Hi, Margaret. I will Hi, Morgan. assign you to a All right, 10 seconds and the, and the rooms are all closed. Everyone will be back. All right. I'm gonna get right into screen sharing here in the meantime. All right. Okay. So we're back again. Um, some Hopefully some great conversations had in the small groups there. Um, again, just a chance to touch base if I don't know if we've got anything in the chat or does anybody have a question at this point before I get into the last uh, tier here, which is kind of more exposure to different platforms that are out there? Awesome. All right. Um, so the same thing, I put my email here. This one, though, um, the link is going to take you to the next tier, the next slideshow that I've, I've been talking about here. Um, so we'll get into that. So if, if you're going to share these with your, some of the people in your schools, let them know like when they're ready for it, they just kind of click on these and it should walk them through these different tiers in, in kind of the same way here. Okay. So I say this is only, I say 
I, I sort of regret the title is for tech savvy distance learning hosts. Um, I, I'm not saying you can't learn it. I'm saying some of these might be a little bit more overwhelming in terms of the features they offer at first. However, um, so many of these platforms know right off the bat, if you're not a tech savvy person yet, they've done a lot of work to make some one-on-one -on -one type tutorials that make it very functional, very easy to use. So um, I'll talk about this at the end, but there's, there's, it's become so much easier to learn technology these days. So even if you're not that tech savvy person, listen in for what you might want to use in your classroom. Um, so some of what I'm going to touch on here, um, you know, I've got Flipgrid, which you might have been hearing about, Padlet, um, delivering instruction, different options for that, collaborative types of annotation that might be useful, um, assessment platforms and lesson supplementation, and, and even a couple of extensions here at the end. Um, so what is Flipgrid? It's asynchronous. It's, uh, so you can post anytime. It's video based. It's prompted learning. You can use it for assessment. Um, uh, the link on that title slide actually takes you to Flipgrid's website. There's a tutorial here. Um, I, I say it's how we became the learning bunch. The best way I can, the best analogy I can give is it, it turns into sort of a Brady Bunch style home screen, right? Like it kind of puts your work or your video or whatever it is that you're posting in kind of a grid layout. Um, and it, so if it's a class of 10 to 20 people or five people, you'd be able to see all those learning artifacts there on, in one place. Um, and it's got some, some great features there. So again, uh, this tutorial with educators in mind, other people are using Flipgrid, but this one's maybe, this tutorial is maybe more focused on school and school use. Um, there are tons of resources to help you learn that platform. So again, it might be overwhelming at first, but just be willing and click through. They also have an available library of lessons and content and topics that you can import. So right now with that substitution, it's like, look, I teach this lesson, but I teach it in person. and I don't know how to screencast yet or whatever. Well, you can look through their library and sometimes there's like a stock presentation on it that helps you kind of get there. Um, it's got some similar social media features. So if your students are into social media, they can react to each other's learning with things like emojis and that sort of thing. So it's, it's kind of familiar in that sense to students. Um, I like it because everyone gets to learn from everyone. Uh, you know, it's all out there. You can click around. Everybody gets to share their learning. So it, it, that might even be that enhancement piece where normally you don't hear from this kid, but look at this incredible product that they presented there and they're willing to kind of put it out there for people. Again, that's a classroom culture. We might have to get students used to the fact that learning's a little bit more public now. Um, and, and that's something we have to think about. How are we gonna look at privacy settings, make sure it's not shared with the world, it's just there with our class, and, and just taking steps to make sure that you can provide that environment for your students. Um, it also lets you import class lists. So from different platforms, you don't have to manually enter all your, your learners in there. Um, so that might be something to look for in some of these platforms. In the free version, some of the drawbacks, you have to think about some of these platforms have limitations on the time or number of video posts that you can do. Um, so just look at that. Um, it, you know, I try, I try it out in the free version before you invest in the paid. Um, the aesthetic is really bright and, and sometimes gives the impression of like younger audiences, but you can control some of those settings and customize how it looks. So again, kind of like kid blog, you might have to sell it to older students, but um, it does work great and looks great. I, I think you see a lot of the benefits to it. Sorry if you hear my dog scratching. Bert doesn't like to be separated from me, so he's like barking at the door here. Um, and then the all participants must be comfortable with recording themselves. So there, there is a video component to it. And um, he, uh, uh, so sorry, got distracted. Bert made his way in. Uh, so this is something, so if they're not comfortable being on camera, maybe they can put like an avatar of themselves in front of the lens, right? Or they can record the audio, but put a piece of tape over the camera. So. Uh, just think about those accommodations that you might have to make for, for kids that don't want to be on camera, um, but they at least have to be comfortable like putting their voice on there and in and, and different ways. They might be able to use some other platforms for that. Um, so how would I use it? Is a variety here just in the interest of time so we don't run out. I'm going to kind of let you read through some of those, but a um, couple of highlights. Um, ask students to deliver mini presentations. A lot of us are looking for that like platform that this is one that could work for that. You could host book talks on here, you know, read this section. What's your reaction to it? How do you feel about Holden Caulfield or, um, you know, whoever it is? Um, you can deliver a mini lesson and then have Flipgrid be how students share their understanding of it. Um, or if you're looking for that collaborative piece, they can post their learning 
and ask for peer or teacher feedback, like what works, what doesn't, what changes would you make, and, and, and has the ability to kind of put that stuff on there. Um, this makes me think of that classroom culture one. I, I participated in a PD where Padlet was the started year activity. Um, it's a multimedia platform. You can post and share learning. Uh, if you want to be a Padlet-er, there wasn't a good word for it, so I made it. Um, there's a tour here of how you can use it, but um, the way it was used is basically, think of it like kind of like virtual post-it notes. Um, so Flipgrid is more like a contained frame where you can put like the video in it. Padlet, you can put all sorts of stuff on there, text boxes, images, multimedia, that sort of thing. And so um, I'd, I'd ask students for like a, a post-it basically of, um, you know, what's those icebreakers that we do at the start of the year, right? Like, what are you most excited about learning this year? What's the object in your home that you would tell a story about? What's, uh, I grew up with two older brothers. What scar story do you have? Um, like that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, this, this one's, they don't have to put themselves on there. They can do text and images of other things. So if you've got those shy students, this might be a better platform for that classroom culture for you. There's just so many ways that it can be used as, as again, another platform where you can kind of pull the learning together. Um, you can do it individually or as a class so that everybody gets to see each other's work and, and there's um, benefits to that. Uh, oops, that is not what I intended to do. All right, and we're back. So, um, and I talked through some of these things. There's no size limit on the number of people, so that's kind of a, a benefit here. And it's a pretty intuitive click to learn kind of website. So um, I'd say Padlet may be a little more user friendly than Flipgrid at first. Um, the aesthetic of it, how it looks, is not always eye catching. Like you can literally drag and drop stuff anywhere. So sometimes when you get a class together, it's like they're stacked on top of each other. Or it's just, it kind of looks messy. It kind of looks like your desk in June, um, that sort of thing. So uh, just be aware that you can control the theme and images and that sort of thing. But um, you might need to do a little work to like have it something that you, you love. Um, and it's sometimes students can post without filtering or moderation by the teacher. There's some settings you can control there. Um, and, and some of the templates may not bring up may bring up content that's not suitable for children. So they also have like libraries of things that you can surf. So if you've got younger students, some of the templates are for like adult learning, um, and just to be aware of like what's out there. It's almost like an unfiltered web search. You might need to put some of the same precautions in for this that you would for for internet browsing, depending on your age groups. Um, but I mentioned you can create boards where students post their learning artifacts. You can generate virtual tours of concepts and ideas, right? So click here, then click here, then click here, then click here. If, if you're trying to send your students all over the world because they've been cooped up in their house since March, um, you can post prompted discussion topics and then encourage like a multimedia response to it. So if I did a question on classroom, I, I tend to either get like text or links. Here I can make these like multimedia collages and that might better reflect where a student's at. You get a really musical student, they wanna like, compose something that reflects their learning. They can do that. So um, there's just some beautiful outputs here that might mix up the learning a little bit. Um, this is one that maybe people were hoping I'd get to first, but um, I'm gonna show you just three platforms for delivering instruction. So I think one of the things we're all thinking is like, how am I going to teach? Um, so I put three here um, to choose from. With Screencastify, I know um, Tiff was commenting earlier on Loom, that's another one, L-O-O-M. Uh, Screencast-O-Matic is another one. It is a catchy, catchy name, Screencast-O-Matic. Um, Screencast-O-Matic, apparently, I've learned this since I created this, has a little better interaction with the GC, um, and it's a little bit more like user-friendly. Screencastify is, is sort of an every person's um, screencasting app, the free version is, is pretty good. The paid version is pretty affordable. I think if you're looking for district licenses, Screencast-O-Matic is a little more affordable, um, but Screencastify, I know, works on all types of like HP versus Mac or PC versus Mac. Screencast-O-Matic, my understanding is if, you, if your school uses Chromebooks, um, that it doesn't have great interaction with Chromebooks. And I don't have more information on that. I sort of just learned that the other day. So for some, when you're choosing a screencasting platform, you really want to think about across your school, across your district, across your learners, right? Think of the technology your learners have at home. Um, I put Screencastify on here because to my knowledge, it's the one that works for most, okay? Um, there's no length limit on recording. It's got some, I say easy editing features. I'm gonna say that's a lie. Uh, 
<laughs> I tried it and I thought they were easy and then it took a couple, like a lot of this stuff, right? Like click to learn experiment. Um, however, it is simple to export. Uh, if you've got the G Suite, it saves right to your drive automatically. It even has an upload to YouTube option. So there's a variety of ways that you can share it afterward. Um, explain everything is also a screencasting tool, but it's a much more feature rich platform and it's got an excellent, excellent, excellent whiteboard feature so you can annotate your lessons, right? Um, some of you have seen those like animated videos where they're drawing cartoons as you learn and you're like, I wish I could draw like that. And, and I often think that, um, but you can use it live also. So this is one where instead of like Meet or, or Zoom, you can actually teach live and have that whiteboarding capacity on screen at the same time. And it's got a really impressive aesthetic to it. So it, it's a little intimidating to learn, but it's a great platform. Uh, Parlay Ideas is one that is coming up more and more. It, <laughs> it's a self-dubbed title, but it's called The Future of Class Discussion as a, a, a looming title that I hope they live up to. Uh, it's a feature rich platform. You can collect formative data on there. So it has some screencasting ability, but also some whiteboarding and other assessment tools on there. And it also has a library of topics. So again, if you're looking to not be the originator of everything for your class right now, you sort of need some lessons you can just use. Um, there is a library on that one. And that, that might be the case on some of these other platforms coming up as more and more people are using them. But right now they, they actually have um, by topic, by grade level, those sorts of things that you can pick from. Uh, something to think about collaborative annotation like I, I want my students to look at something think about it and, and be able to record that um, now comment is kind of a sophisticated platform that classes can annotate text or images or videos and it's a free platform so if I'm working with um, something in the public domain of course I'll put that disclaimer there but I'm, I'm working with a classic piece of literature I'm working with a science article I'm working with a, a National Geographic article for social studies you can put that on there and then they students can highlight and attach comments to it much like you would in like a Google Google Doc um, but the benefit is that they can see and respond to each other in sort of this running dialogue on the right hand side um, and they can even put links in there they can put images on there um, I, we analyze art sometimes, so I'll put a piece of art on there and they can annotate what they see in the piece of art that makes them think or respond. Um, so it's, it's a nice like multimedia platform to like show how people are interacting with these texts. If, if you've sat in on Morgan's Visible Learning PD and, and those sorts of things, like there's a great opportunity for students to show you what they know, like visibly, you know, show you what they know. ThingLink. Um, takes a little bit more uh, like getting used to, but it's awesome for creating annotated images and tours. Basically, you can put an image on there. So I teach Lincoln's greatest speech. I put an image of Lincoln delivering his second inaugural address, and I was able to annotate where, um, you know, his assassinated, his, his, the, the person that killed Lincoln is standing right here in the crowd behind him. Here, look at the mix of people in the crowd. And then those links took, me to other resources that students could kind of like read through to kind of get a sense of what it was or, or how it was that Lincoln was speaking that day. So it really encourages that multimedia learning and sharing that, that 21st century literacy that we've been talking about. It takes some experimentation to learn, but it's a really powerful platform for some of those types of learning opportunities. This might be again that modification redefinition thing that we've been talking about. Some of you are looking for more assessment platforms, however, so um, just Quickly, Quizlet, some of you prefer Kahoot. Uh, I mean, there's tons out there. Um, what I like about Quizlet is that there's differentiated levels of testing from basic to advanced understanding. It's great for like science terms where like there's a, a bastion of vocabulary that they need to know and be able to apply. And they start at the basic level with that all the way to like the application of those terms at the end. Uh, there's also a library of content available. You can create your own, you can import one and then customize it. So like. I taught Macbeth, I can, I can import some people's study sets for Macbeth or quote decks for Macbeth and then take the ones I like or add in the ones that I feel are more important to the way I teach. Um, you get instant feedback and data and, and you can adapt it to a variety of learning styles. There's even some opportunities to use it like a game uh, and it has some really easy integration with a bunch of different platforms. Go Formative, uh, this is a newer one for me. My wife has used this more than I have. She teaches fifth grade. Um, you get real-time information and data on student work, so there's some grading for you. So uh, math in particular, it's, it's a really powerful math learning tool. 
Um, there's a, also a library of content though for all subject areas. I, I spotlighted math because it's strong there, but it, it has a library of content for all content areas. Again, lots of easy integration and, and you can see student growth over time. So it's almost like a learning management system uh, where like there's formative data along the way and you can eventually see how it turns out and you can generate a variety of question types from from the one word answers to the short answer responses and so depending on what it is you're asking for from your students um, there's some really nice options in there to explore if you're looking to supplement your lessons right so I, I have a bank or I haven't gotten to that yet I know I want to teach this but again I, I, I sort of need that out there or I taught it this way and my students still aren't getting it and I'm not there in person to do that conferencing that I normally do um, these are some platforms where you can go that there's some you know pre-taught content that you can surf and, and maybe say here try this lesson this way and maybe it syncs in better for you so um, Khan Academy I think um, everybody's friends with Sal at this point um, there's um, ELA is a little bit weaker uh, just because some of what we teach is like hard to project, right? Like novel interaction and stuff like that. But there's some excellent grammar lessons on there for ELA. Um, and there's tons of stuff for math and science and all these other content areas. So it's a massive library of lessons. And again, with how many more people are using it, I expect that, that library is growing by the day, by the minute. Um, the, the videos are engaging. It's a good example of how to maybe use whiteboarding. You might want to go on Khan Academy and look at how some, a concept is taught, right? Like, how am I going to teach this virtually? here's some role modeling right uh, they do it well it's really well scaffolded for most subject areas and you can still track student progress there's uh, some of the, the library has like assessments associated with them and you can see how your students are doing with those concepts um, TED ed is also a great library of lessons and content um, there, there's you know we're the voice in the room so much of the time but there's so many great engaging speakers out there so see what they say about it um i just was in a session yesterday where somebody mentioned like a beyonce ted talk about how her difference about like performance learning and that sort of thing um never would have used that not a beyonce person but now i can't get all the single ladies out of my head and probably that's the case for you too so sorry but not sorry um there's uh one thing i like about it is there's really structured predictable lesson structure too you can create your own ted ed lesson and it's like, think about this, discuss this. And it's, it's like a five set series that you can take or um, keep or remove those layers. You can make it simpler than that. So um, for your students who really need that walk me through kind of structure, predictable, regular, uh, this is a good one to mix in there from time to time. And it's a really safe forum for sharing ideas. If they create their own TED-Ed account, um, you can actually respond directly to whatever they post on there and it'll email you if you ask for that directly so you be like so and so posted you respond to them directly uh, i'm going to cover just a few extensions really quick extensions if you don't know or um these i will say are for google chrome um sorry to be such a google person but they're it's like the app store or apps on your phone you can install these on a the chrome platform and it makes life a little bit easier share to classroom is one um, if you're on the web and you find a great article, you can install this extension, click a little button, and it will post it on your Google Classroom automatically. You don't have to navigate around, you don't have to save it as a PDF. If you have students install it on their browser, you can actually push that article out as a tab on their computer. So if I'm in class sitting at my teacher desk and be like, I want everybody to read this, and boom, it's what they're looking at on their computer, which is kind of great. Um, web Paint allows you to annotate that article. So it'd be like, okay, I want you to read this, but I want, I'm gonna circle in red with the best of my motor skills, this section of the article. And this is the part, don't read everything else, just read this and we're gonna respond to this in five minutes. Um, Google Cast for Education, again, has to be installed on both yours and the student's computer, but if you have a monitor in your room or some capability, a student, so if you've got group presentations or individual presentations, they can cast through your computer. If your students' computers aren't connected to the monitor, they can cast through your computer to the monitor and you get to moderate it so that you'll see what they're trying to display. So, you know, Jimmy doesn't put the middle finger up there and you're like, oh, time to take that Jimmy thing down. Um, so you get to see what they're posting first and then allow it, so to speak, to happen. Uh, you got to have something fun. A little personality goes a long way. How are we injecting ourselves? So Bitmoji, if you don't know it, um, is actually an extension and you can create an avatar of yourself. You can insert your avatars everywhere. Google Slides, Google Docs, um, you know, Word Docs. It basically, it's like an image you could paste anywhere. You could paste an image. So if you want yourself to be represented in more places virtually, 
maybe make a Bitmoji install that extension and um, it, it even interact with Gmail now automatically you can put your avatar in Gmail um, somebody has to help me I still don't know if this is a hard G or a soft G Giphy or Jiffy I've heard both um, sometimes a GIF is just a really powerful funny way to kind of share something um, and this one lets you kind of like Bitmoji insert it right away um, and, and so it might speak for you. If you've seen memes and those sorts of things, a lot of those are like little short animated clips that you can put in there. Um, and even save to Google Drive, there's a button, there's an extension you can do so that um, instead of, again, downloading it as a PDF on your desktop and then having to drag that PDF and upload it to Drive, you could just do that right away. So if there's something you want to save and teach in the future, there's an extension for you right there. Okay. That was a ton of ground to cover. So I think we're still relatively on track here. Ooh, we're at 10, Morgan, sorry. Um, do we have time for a breakout? We're good? Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna do okay. my best for my need and, and split myself. But yeah, go ahead, take okay. the time you need. Great, so um, you just heard about a ton of technology. So the, the last breakout question here is out of all the technology you've heard about in this presentation, which one, and yes, I'm asking you to make a commitment uh, put a ring on it if we're on the Beyonce theme still. Uh, which one is your top priority to explore and what do you plan to do with it? Okay, uh, that maybe feels like a lot of pressure. So like do your best with it, but let's just pick one thing. I think some of this technology, we get so overwhelmed. What one thing is gonna maybe most serve you right now, right? I, I most need to do this, so therefore this is gonna be it. Okay, so five minutes and we'll see everybody back here for a wrap up. Neil, do you want to go to a room? Uh, I'll hold up on this one. <laughs> My voice could use a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm just looking at them. Okay. All right, I'm going to pause. They haven't come back. Okay, okay. we are resuming. All right. Can I ask a question really quick? How much longer are we going to go? Uh, just a few more minutes. Okay. Yep. 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 And, and so, actually, this was the space for any any other questions too. Things that may have come up in that last discussion. Neil, I have one just quick thing. This is sure. Angela. Um, we were talking that in the last breakout session about you know the idea of finding what is pre-existing for one especially with content alone um you know a set vocabulary of fiction analysis terms yeah. will, will be like from teacher to teacher and i think um, rather than sort of being overwhelmed at having to recreate everything from scratch if we are in a remote or hybrid model i think it's important for us as educators to return to that advice of not re not trying to reinvent the wheel but to find what exists and then how we use that and how we have our students extend or practice or build on that would be helpful so i think uh, collaboration among people in our discipline and then across different sources is um, sort of important I, th I think not thinking that we have to build up from zero would be helpful Sure. Um, and have you seen, so like some of the ones that I mentioned that have libraries of content, is, is that helpful? Is that kind of what you're looking for? Yeah. Okay. And then there's actually a document at the end to do what you're talking about there, um, where if people want to, they can put their names down as to like the kind of collaboration that they want. Um, so if you're willing to put your contact information out there and you're like, I want to learn X, um, you'd put that in there and maybe that becomes sort of a PLN. So definitely like good thinking. Any other questions? Okay, and again, you can always email me. I'm not just in the interest that we're already over, so uh, I'm gonna kind of get to the end here. Um, if you're 
as old as me at least, um, you'll know what a mixtape is. So I made you a mixtape. Um, this is something I would encourage you guys to do on your own. Uh, these are all YouTube links. So if you didn't know it, you can subscribe to YouTube channels. I would encourage you to maybe make a, a private profile, pay attention to privacy settings on all of these things. I can't say that enough. Um, and there are tutorials about how to do that out there. You might need to watch some of those and be like, especially YouTube now has a, a law that they passed this year about if you're presenting a YouTube to a, a kid of a certain age, there's some like disclaimers that you have to put on there to make sure that it's age appropriate. So, uh, but create a YouTube profile for yourself, change your privacy settings. And then I would start following people that know about technology. So um, the reason I say Holy Alice Keeler is because it became a phrase of mine when I added her to my Twitter feed. Um, so Twitter is another powerful place to get inspired by educators. There's some awesome Twitter discussions and hashtags to follow where they just post ideas. And um, if you need to grow your perspective of collaboration, it's a great way to do it. Uh, but the Holy Alice Keeler came because when I subscribed to her Twitter feed, I felt like I was getting a notification every 20 minutes. She has this amazing productivity, which is both beautiful and terrifying. So she's a great one-stop shop, especially for um, the G Suite, Google, and education. She has tons and tons of tutorials. I'm talking like a minute and 30 seconds long where like, you know how to use it now. So she might be one to kind of like follow. Uh, the new EdTech Classroom um, and Google for Education are two more that you might follow that again, have a, a spectrum of technology tutorials that are out there if you're trying to learn. Um, I, I say this too as a tip, when you're searching for these resources, pay attention to the year in which they were revised, edited, or published. So Google Classroom 2020 looks very different even three months ago than it does right now. There's features coming out all the time. So if you get to a tutorial that's from 2017, you're like, great, I know how to use this. And then you go to that platform and it looks totally different because they've changed some of those features. So with all of this, as you're finding the people that help you the most with technology, um, make sure that you're kind of filtering for, for when it's published and that it's up to date. Um, and just some final thoughts to kind of take away from here. Um, I, I think one of the things that we have to prepare ourselves, so beyond keeping it simple in, in distance learning, it, make it as simple as possible at first. Don't add too many complex layers. Some of these things are so feature rich and it's so tempting and be like, this would be an awesome learning experience, but keep it simple at first as we're all sort of getting used to this. Um, but also think about variety. Simplicity doesn't mean there can't be variety. If you choose one of these platforms and all your lessons are the same all the time, um, it's like speaking monotone in the classroom. You're just gonna get tuned out. So pick one right now, but maybe learn a few to have that variety of learning out there, just like we would in our classroom too, right? We don't tend to teach the same way every day. And, and along those lines, when you're finding those things, just don't be afraid to click to learn uh, and surf what's out there. I, I, hopefully this was a helpful presentation, but I'm not the smartest person on the internet and there are so many people doing it so well. I, it, chances are you don't even have to modify your question. What do you want to know? What, what error message are you seeing on your screen? Type that into Google and there's probably a tutorial to help you fix it. And, and so if you have that mentality, if you're humble, patient, and experimental, I think that's kind of the formula for moving forward. Humble in the sense of like, reach out for help. You're not on your own technology island. You know, you've got my email, you've got the people who are here today. Patience, uh, no one to walk away, right? Uh, like, Technology can be frustrating. Your Wi-Fi drops in the middle of something that you forgot to save first, you know, whatever. Just you're going to have to bring that there. Then experimental, like try something new. Like there's so much of what we do as teachers. It's like I'm finally at the point where I'm comfortable with what I teach and now I have to develop it all over again. If you can be experimental about it, it's good. Um, and so um, this last link here, and I think Morgan's going to post this in the chat in a second. Um, something else to think about is how to establish that new PLN. Um, per, or professional learning network, um, you might need a new network of peers for distance learning. Um, and so if you're willing to, I, I made that Google sheet with uh, basically your name, your school, your content area, your email that you're willing to share. And then in the last column, it's like, what do you want to learn? What, what kind of a network are you looking for? Is it just generally distance learning? It can be that broad or it could be more some of these specific platforms. If you're a, a, a G Suite school and you need to like, just put the G Suite, like I need to know all the functions and capabilities of this. I, I did one PD yesterday just on Google Classroom um, and, and there was a lot of ground to cover there. So um, that's enough to maybe bite, bite off for the summer. Uh, so I wanna mention a couple of technical. So I put in the link, but the links didn't go. But I put in the link for um, the uh, uh, Padlet 
And um, certainly underneath, if you look underneath my signature, you see that I have the link to the Padlet there as well. And so uh, Neil, I'm sure, will send me his slides, share them with me, and we'll post those in the Padlet. And I've posted a document, excuse me, that has um, the links that, that Neil has mentioned, these that didn't post his links here. Um, and uh, the questions for today and also how to get, get your contact hours. Giving us feedback is really, really helpful. Um, and you get your, your, your contact hours as a result of that. So I think those are some of the technical issues, technical follow-up. Um, is there anything else? We, we went over, but I, I think it was a worthy um, overtime. <laughs> <laughs> good good um well and I, I guess i'll i'll add on here just again my email is right there if, you, if you've got questions and, and you you know uh, try some things on your own first i think that's important before you sort of you know go for the quick answer but um I, i'm i'm willing i'll get to you if i can um the last resource is sort of for those tech savvy people if if what i covered today is sort of already what you know hopefully there's at least one new thing in there um jennifer gonzalez again keep bringing her up. She has a more complete, the, the first one was that curated list, which is smaller. Every year she publishes a teacher's guide to tech. So there's a 2020 teacher's guide to tech out there. Um, and she goes into depth about parlay ideas. I think it's one of the like top five that she highlights. Um, it, it's a paid PDF, but it's well worth it. Um, if you're looking for it, it's curated, but not as gently. It, it, she's put a lot of time and thought into it, but it's much longer. Um, but so if you're like that person who's already comfortable with a lot of this, or you're still looking for that thing that you're going to love, um, I'd highly recommend checking that out and, and it's worthy of, of that investment. So we'll, we'll have this Padlet, um, we'll have this, this slide deck with the links posted to the Padlet, yeah. uh, 